I'm not sure there'll be Social Security left by the time you and I get there. At the rate, at the rate we're spending money as a nation, I. I think they're going to put us all on the Eskimo plan when we get there, push us out to sea, and good luck to you. You know. <laughs> Who is? Yeah. Tennessee ain't one of them, ain't there? No. Oh. No. Well, we caught several. Uh, we uh, we we caught enough to feed 14 people every night. So it was it was a pretty good amount of fish. I mean, it wasn't <clears throat> smallmouth, walleye, and northern pike. And eating northern pikes kind of like eating pistachios. You know, where you got like where you got to pick through all them bones. They're very bony. The meat's very good, but you need a pretty good size one to get. If you get a big northern pike, you can get the fillets off of it. But we never caught one that big. So anyhow, I still didn't get to catch one, but my son did. I guess, you know, there's only one thing better than you not reaching your goals, watching your kids reach your goal. You know what I mean? So, uh, I bought. We stopped at this little old bait place, and we bought leeches. Those leeches are indigenous there. They live in the water and uh, night crawlers. And then I bought this rig called a whopper plopper, and it's a top water, <laughs> and, yeah, and it's got a little tail, and it spins as it, as yeah. you crank it. And I caught biggest smallmouth of my life on that whopper plopper, and so I brought it up here and threw it on Boone, but it didn't quite have the same effect. So <laughs> anyway, but but it was it was pretty good. We had a great time. The thing that was really, well, there was a couple things I really thought was interesting about it. One thing was how long the sun stayed up. Sun was staying up every night till about 11, 11.30 central time, which is like 12, 12.30 eastern time. I guess, well, you know, it, and then when the sun went down, there was like a low glow all the way around you. Like it wasn't, it's like it wasn't fully down. And then it popped right back up at five. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. What's that? Like that? Yeah. What's the winter time? It's blocked. Right. Yeah. See, we're much really we're much further south here in East Tennessee than our uh, Western European ancestors were. You know what I mean? And so we have we enjoy much milder what milder weather. Uh, the other thing that was wild to me was the mosquitoes. Like I have never seen the thickness of mosquitoes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. At, Oh, dude, we had to tie, we had to put weights on ankle, uh, Xander's ankles so they wouldn't carry him away. You could hear you could hear them like when you went in in the evening. There was a certain point you go in your tent, you just hear a hum in the woods, and it was all mosquitoes in the woods. Just to hear a hum, just zzz, you could hear that. And uh, I was like, I, and I told you know I asked my buddy now, I said, what are they living off of? Like there are millions of them. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't understand. Are they feeding off each other? Like how does this work? So. There can't be that many moose up there, is there? I mean, maybe maybe there is. What was the temperature like? In the mornings, 50 to 55, and, uh, and in the day, uh, it'd get up to 80, you know. Uh, it was, and then it... Uh, now, I'll be honest, two day, one day I was cold, and I'm not a cold-natured person at all. It, it, it well, it was a day where the wind was just whipping, and it just whipped all day. Uh, the day we were coming in, you know, we're in these, you know, I don't know what y'all know about the boundary waters, and this isn't the lesson tonight, but we'll, we'll talk about it for a minute. Um, there's no motorized boats allowed in. So you, no motorized boats are allowed in. So you've got to canoe in. And there's like hundreds of these lakes up in the boundary waters. I've got a map, one, and it's one of ten maps. There's that many maps to cover the whole boundary water area. And you've got to have a permit for where you're going to launch. It's all federal land. You know, nobody can build on or nothing. And uh, you got to filter your own water. You know, you got to take something to filter water with from the lake. You're drinking out of that lake all week. And uh, when we took off, the wind was pretty well about as steady 10, 15 miles an hour in our face. And it was like, you know, the waves were about a, eight inches to a foot. But when you're in a 16 foot canoe with two kids and you're, you've got it loaded down with equipment, I mean, it's. 
higher than you think. You know what I mean? I know it don't sound like highways, but it was kind of nerve-wracking. And then a, st a little bit of rainstorm blew in, not a thunderstorm, rainstorm blew in. And buddy, we, got, we, got, we were out there, and I was trying to paddle in that wind. And I've never had this happen. I got a cramp in my left hand, and this, this, hand, this finger on my left hand would not open. It would not open. I couldn't. <laughs> Does it? Well, I had to. I had to get over to the shore and wait about an hour for it to loosen back up. And, and uh, I, I just was like, "What is wrong with my hand?" Is the, uh, trying to argue with it like it was going to listen to me. But anyway, but then we finally made it. So, and it was great. All the guys there were believers, you know. And we had devotions with the boys every night. And there's a group of seven boys and seven adults. And Man, it, you know, some of them boys took to that wild, those woods, just like duck to water. A couple of them, you could tell, like playing video games and staying inside. But anyway, so they weren't all like that. But it was quite an adventure, to say the least. We had the portage. You know, that's where you unpack all your stuff in your canoe, pick your canoe up, put it on your shoulders. Every man's got to carry his canoe. And we had to carry it 39 rods, and the rod is 16 feet. That's the length of a canoe. And it was up a hill, then down a hill, and I don't know which one was harder, going up or going down. It was, it was rough. It's, uh, it's not for the faint of heart, that kind of a trip. It's like, you know, and you know, you, there's no cell phone signal. Like, you can't, you can't get a cell phone bar out there to save your life. You know, you hope, need to be in halfway decent health. Because <laughs> there ain't no help coming, you know. <laughs> You're about a day away from help. Yeah, I told Neil, I said, now, if I stroke out or have a heart attack, I guess just tie me to the back of the canoe and drag me back in or something. I should float. should be enough fat to float me. <laughs> so anyway, but, all right, well, let's, let's take our Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 4, enough of the boundary waters. I'm sure I'll have more illustrations coming to sermons near you. <clears throat> we, uh, it's been a while since we've been back in here. Different various things happened last month. Now we're back in it, and uh, today we're, we're going to see something that looks and feels familiar from the other chapters that we have looked at, but it is different, and it's going to start out here with Nebuchadnezzar having another dream, and in the dream, uh, he's going to want this one interpreted. He does make it a little easier on him this time, and doesn't quite make the threats that he did last time, but... He is not, uh, he is not, he is still a very prideful, egotistical man. And he is, he is definitely trusting in his power and his authority. And what we're going to see happen in the text today is God is going to bring a rather large dose of humility. Uh, so if we can, could I just get a volunteer to read for us tonight? Uh, in Daniel chapter 4, and let's read down through uh, verse 12, just 1 through 12.
C.S. Lewis called it the great sin, uh, and with good reason. It is the sin that led to the fall of Satan. It is the sin that led to the fall of humanity and drove Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden. And of this sin, Lewis says the following, There is one vice of which no man in the world is free, which everyone loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they are guilty themselves. I have heard people admit that they are bad-tempered or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink or even that they are cowards. I do not think I have ever heard anyone who has not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. And at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault that makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking about is, want to take a guess? It's pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite it in Christian morals is called, what's opposite pride? It is humility, right? According to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the uttermost evil, is pride. You know, you think about all the different vices that Christians can have, uh, and, and we can have as people, we can be uncharitable, we can be angry, greedy, drunken people, uh, we can be, and drunken not just on alcohol, but on all sorts of various concepts, ideas, and philosophies on all different things that slow our faculties. Uh, we can be uh, so many different areas, but pride stands overarching. It is through pride, Lewis says, that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. You think Lewis is right? I think he is too. <laughs> and Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher, you know, many of you had to study his sermon in school, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, if you know how Edwards preached, but he would get up every Sunday in a doctoral robe, slide his glasses down on his nose like this, and just read his manuscript word for word. Can you imagine that? And he was reading Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God like that one time, and people began crying out in the middle of the sermon, How then shall we be saved? And they were clinging to the pillars of the church, had to stop the sermon, lead people to the Lord, and go back and finish it. Because it wasn't Jonathan Edwards that was powering that thing. It was the Holy Spirit, wasn't it, that was calling sinners to repent. I mean, that kind of preaching would not be well received in most Baptist churches, I don't think, today. But Jonathan Edwards says this. He had a great theological mind, and he said, and I had much to say about the great sin. He says the following, The first and the worst cause of errors that prevail in such a state of things is spiritual pride. This is the main door by which the devil comes into the hearts of those who are zealous for the advancement of religion. Tis the chief inlet of smoke from the bottomless pit to darken the mind and mislead the judgment. This is the main handle by which the devil has hold of religious persons and the chief source of all the mischief that he introduces. To clog and hinder a work of God, this cause of error is the mainspring, or at least the main support of all the rest. Till, these, till this disease is cured, medicines are in vainly applied to heal other diseases. And uh, I, I could not agree with Edwards more in what he's saying here. Uh, spiritual pride. Pride that is taken on the level with the Pharisees. Were they not the ones that were jeering to put Christ on the cross, right? And is alive and well, unfortunately. Pride is much more difficult to discern than any other uh, corruption, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I hadn't been around leeches a lot since I brought that up. We used that as bait. Um, I don't know if you know this about leeches or not, but you generally don't feel them latch on to you. They have some kind of a chemical they release when they bite. And so they're, they're trying to fly, I guess, the way they're 
design flying under the radar. Xander actually had a leech on his foot when we were moving between camps. I don't know how long it was on him, but by the time we got to camp, it was on there pretty good. And he just, he didn't feel it. He just noticed it whenever he moved his foot across the other one. We pulled that thing off and that foot bled for probably 30 minutes like it had just been pulled off. I had to like wrap gauze and wrap gauze and wrap gauze around it. And in many ways, I've thought pride is like that. It's almost like you don't feel the latch that's on there. You know, it's, it's very self-deceiving, much like a leech. And it pulls away life. Much more difficult to discern in, in that corruption. For that reason, the nature of it does very much consist in a person having too high a thought of themselves. But no wonder that he that has too high a thought of himself doesn't know it. For it necessitates here that the opinion one has of oneself is what one has just grounds for and therefore not too high. So it's sort of round thinking and why it, it deceives us. The heart is so deceitful and unsearchable. Nothing in the world uh, is quite like this. It's a matter, uh, and it can coax itself into appearing that there is no sin at all. One of my favorite books I read on church conflict when I was in seminary was titled, Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. <laughs> and uh, doesn't that encompass so many so many struggles and fights we have the reason we can't settle conflicts in the body is because we're too prideful is because one won't won't go in humility or the other won't go in humility i remember reading in that book the author said most church conflicts can never be resolved only managed and you think, that's sad, isn't it? You think about that with our families. Is that a true statement for our families as well? There can be only one reason that conflicts cannot be resolved but only managed, and that is because of pride. It's because of pride. The heart is so deceitful. It is, an, it is a terrible matter. Difficult to convince of this work. The very nature of it, self-confidence, and to drive away into humility. Proverbs 8.13 tells us this, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And it says, I, this is what the Lord says in this proverb. The Lord says, I hate arrogant pride, evil conduct, and pervasive speech. Perhaps no one in the Bible came to understand this truth better than King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Right? Proud of his accomplishments, and proud of his speech, he, leaned the, he, or he learned the hard way that pride comes before destruction. Isn't that what Proverbs teaches us in Proverbs 16, 18? And an arrogant spirit before a fall. And in this chapter tonight, we see Nebuchadnezzar's fall. He learned the hard way that you can be a king set up to rule the entire known world. And then in a day's time, because the Lord has willed it, you will live like a cow in the field. <laughs> there is no lower demotion for a king than to eat grass from the field like cattle. He learned the hard way that the Most High God is God. And he, and might I add, we are not are we? God hates pride because it challenges his sovereignty. One of the things that's fascinating to me in this chapter is how many verses are in direct reference to the sovereignty of God. You see, pride questions his will and his ways. It claims a position and power for mere morals that rightly belong to the king of heaven. Daniel 4, uh, here, through the, humili through the humiliation and then the restoration of a powerful man on earth in that day, it reminds us that God is in control and that we are not, that He is sovereign and that He sets up kingdoms 
and he knocks them down. He sets up rulers, and he knocks them down, right? These words in chapter 4 for us as modern-day believers, these are words of warning, right? They're words of warning. Warning for us and warnings for our leaders, aren't they? Be careful. What God did to Nebuchadnezzar, he can do now. It scares me a little bit. It's true, though. I mean, think about what Nebuchadnezzar has seen to this point. Let's review. What has Nebuchadnezzar seen God do to this point? Do you recall what's happened in chapters 1 through 3? He, he's seen God reveal the dream to Daniel and then the interpretation both, right? Saw that. That, that should be enough. To let him know this is a, this this you know immigrant we captured and brought to Babylon there's something to this God he worships right and what else has he seen Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and then a fourth individual looks like the son of man right he has it was so hot the guys that pushed him in burned up you know what is the old Native American uh, saying you know white man builds a big fire stands far away we build small fires, stand close, you know. <laughs> Big fire, hot, you know, no doubt. Probably, I think we discussed, could have been what they used to make that statue of himself. Even though he had seen God reveal to Daniel what his dream meant, he built a statue to himself. He calls for the people to worship him. He is a, he's an egotistical maniac, right? I mean, and when we meet him in chapter 1, what's he saying? If they don't, if they don't discern the dream, he's going to, what, rip their limbs off and destroy their houses. And this guy means business, right? Now, by the time we get to chapter 4, he's seen the Lord do some things. And at the end of chapter 3, we see him bowing down, you know, in front of the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and proclaiming the God that is there. And so in the start of chapter 4 here, his tone has changed slightly, but has his heart, right? That's the issue. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, do all the people's languages that dwell on the earth, peace be, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done. So this, is a, this feels like a different tune than chapter 1, doesn't it? It's like you're thinking, well, maybe this guy is truly a believer, right? Maybe he's finally come around. I mean, he's seen the dream interpreted. He's seen the guys pulled out of the fire. He's, he might be getting it. He might be getting it now. But... Uh, these words of assurance and comfort, um, they're, they're not, I don't think, totally founded in a heart that truly believes. You know, as I said a minute ago, Proverbs eighteen twelve. before his downfall, a person's heart is proud, but humility comes before honor. Humility comes before honor. Uh, here's a great thing. Pascal uh, said this, do you wish people to think well of you? Don't speak well of yourself. <laughs> I think that's pretty good words to, to live by, right? I like that. All right, the king had given here in the beginning of chapter 3 another kingly decree. Feels different. It's also similar to chapter 2, having, having a dream and needing an interpretation, right? And the dream is different this time too, right? And this, this dream also disrupts Nebuchadnezzar's sleep. Right, he can't sleep, it's bothering him. And it's fascinating to me here who he calls on first to interpret the dreams. I don't know about you, but I think I know whose shoulder I'd be tapping, right? <laughs> Just go straight to Daniel, right? But is that who he goes to? You know, what is that old Chinese proverb? It is madness to do the same actions over and over again and expect different results, right? Unless it's a computer, and then it's not madness. Okay, well, I didn't know that was the exception. You would know, Jerry, not me. Uh, and so he calls his, his, all these wise men and magicians in, and he asks them about the dream. And, of course, their answer is what? You know what it kind of reminds me of? It reminds me of Christians who get up in the morning and read their horoscopes. First thing. like You know what I mean? Like, they get up in the morning, 
and they don't get the Bible out, they don't consult what God's will is, they get the paper out or they pull it up online and they read the horoscope as if the day you were born somehow has anything to do with your personality, right? You know, as if the, the, the alignment of stars and all this stuff, it's like looking everywhere possible, but the direct source of where you're supposed to be looking. And Nebuchadnezzar is guilty of this. And this is, this is a, in my opinion, this is an ignoring of one who speaks for the Lord, right? It's just, let's start out with what we can get here, and then if that doesn't work, we'll fall back on what the Lord says. Isn't that kind of like the world today? It is. Mm -hmm. Stuff that's so evident to us, but yet the world's so blind to it. Oh, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's, let's try everything. You know, it's, you know, my kids are old enough now, they're starting to pay attention to like, we don't have cable TV or nothing, but they go to my parents' house, my parents still have a cable box, and they have different channels. They don't have anything inappropriate. They have like, they just have like the whole span. They have like a cable package. And so one channel they have is the history channel, and Asher is getting to a point where he really likes to study history, and he finds it interesting, and that's fine. He's getting it honest. I have a minor in history in college. He's like, Dad, what do you think about the history channel? And I said, I think it's terrible. <laughs> it is absolutely terrible. There is little to no history on the History Channel. Like, I remember we were watching through and the History Channel was advertising, tonight, tune in and find out how aliens really created humanity. And you're like, are you kidding me? Like, people are running. It, it, in, in the unbeliever's mind, it is more plausible that an advanced alien race came here and mated with chimpanzees and outpopped human beings than it is that God created us in his image. Like, that blows my mind, but that's where the culture is. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar is, isn't it? If there are, yeah. My, my opinion is this. I think that people do see stuff in the sky sometimes. I think it's all deception from demons is what I think it is. That's my opinion. I have heard, I've read accounts of people who have been abducted by aliens and they have cried out from help from Jesus Christ and it ceased immediately so to me like if they really were space aliens I don't think Jesus Christ's name would have the same effect unless they were demonic so I think it's all because you got to ask yourself is this helpful to the Christian faith or is this just a distraction away from it and if it falls into the category of distraction then I think that it's not of the Lord so that's that's my simplistic thinking tonight but I think that's the way it is and these magicians are there, these enchanters, these Chaldeans, these astronomers. And they cannot deliver the goods. Shocker. Um, the decree in chapter 4 is cut from a little bit different cloth, though, isn't it? Uh, there is a personal testimony, a sort of a gospel track, a, a, dis, a dispension before a, a judge and a jury here. And they're all wrapped up into this amazing story. And in making this decree, Nebuchadnezzar wishes to honor the Most High God whom Daniel serves and, that, and his other friends serve as well. He, but he, <laughs> he didn't lead with him. He didn't drive with him. You know, he was only at the point where he was bothered uh, to a great extent before he even turns to him for help. He, be, he begins by, not, by noting the universe and even uh, missional nature of what is about to be shared. He addresses everyone, right, in, in verse 1. And Nebuchadnezzar were alive today. I imagine he would call many press conferences and he would take advantage of any social media platform so that every living person possible could see him and what he's about to say. There is language steeped here in biblical terminology. I think it's altogether possible that Daniel... The Bible doesn't say this, but because of the way Nebuchadnezzar is speaking, I think Daniel could have helped him with this address. Uh, we'll see in chapter 4 that Daniel apparently has a friendship with Nebuchadnezzar, that he, has a, and he actually has a, a care for him and a compassion for him. You'll see that when he delivers the interpretation. And I think that's great, right? I think it's okay for Christians to have, and, and really we should have, a compassion for those that are put into our lives. Even the egotistical maniacs like Nebuchadnezzar, we can love them and have compassion on them. You know, the one place you don't have much of a choice is your family, right? You got the family you got. And so you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna have a choice there and you're gonna have to love even in particular. 
in, in some situations where you definitely don't agree with them or see eye to eye with them or are definitely not on the same page. So d- steeped in terminal pi- bi- um, biblio- biblical terminology here, may your prosperity increase sort of like a blessing instead of tell me what it says or I'm going to rip you limb from limb. It's got a different feel to it altogether, right? I can just almost see Daniel being like, now listen, Nebuchadnezzar, we've been together for several years now. Don't lead in with the whole, I'm going to rip your limbs off and tear your houses down. That doesn't win, that doesn't win friends and influence people. Maybe, maybe try something else. Maybe wish them blessings to start with, right? That, that'll do better for you, right? Uh, so what changed in him? I think Nebuchadnezzar knows what God has done, and there's a part of him that is impressed with that. But I don't know at this point that it is convictional in conversion. Does that make sense? And I, and I think there's a lot of people that are in a category like Nebuchadnezzar. They are impressed with what God has done in the Scriptures. They find it fascinating and amazing that God opened the Red Sea, swallowed up Egypt. They find it amazing that Jesus was delivered from the grave and that he walked out of it. They find it a miracle after miracle in the, in the Old Testament of Elijah bringing back the widow's son. All these things fascinate them. And they have a fascination with the things of God and yet lack the conversion and conviction that is needed. It's more of an infatuation that is there. And so they're try- it's like what this feels like to me is Nebuchadnezzar trying to come to grips with the truth and grandeur of who God is, but he's doing it through a pagan ideology and worldview. Does that make sense? It's like he's trying to get his hands around it, but he's coming at it with a worldly way of trying to do it. He is, yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Um, there's all, the verse 3 it almost reads like a hymn of, of praise or doxology. Um, brackets here, the chapter. The words recall, it feels like Psalm 145, 13, which is why I think Daniel probably helped him, right? Because he would have had access to that. Two parallels here, how great are God's miracles and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. No God is like this God in what he does and no God is like this God in what he has. Nebuchadnezzar's worldview and spiritual perspective had been turned on its head and he's trying to make pagan adjustments but he's just still not quite getting it. C.S. Lewis once more provides a good, a really good insight. He says, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. And I thought that is a very insightful take for Nebuchadnezzar at this point. He's been looking down, hasn't he, from his throne and his authority. He is now looking up and trying to glorify God that is there. Daniel, uh, so that's what we see as an intro. Now, as we move into what we were just reading, one point I want to make here is we make this transition into four. It is good when our great and sovereign God troubles our hearts in order to get our attention. Have you ever had God trouble your heart before to get your attention? (laughs) Right? It's like some people said, you know, God usually... I've talked to a lot of my pastor friends, and I have seen this in ministry. Uh, God is God is so very patient with us, so very patient. Um, he is much more patient than I am, right? God always gives a shot across the bow, right? Everybody knows that war terminology. He gives a shot across the bow. That's a warning shot from one ship to an enemy ship, saying you're too close, back up. You need to turn around, go back where you were. And God does that, but he, he usually kind of does it in phases, like in sort of like warnings for believers in particular, right? First, it's sort of a prod or a poke, turn around, you know. Eventually, it can get all the way up to a two-by-four across the back, right? You need to, you need to turn around now, right? Uh, and then sometimes if that doesn't work, the consequences can be even worse. Listen to Psalm 10:4. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. That's what the NIV says. Isn't that interesting? The wicked man 
does not seek God in all his thoughts there's no room for God so what's what's his thoughts captivated with if there's no room for God itself self and self-preservation Augustine one of the early church fathers said this if you plan to build a tall house of virtues you must first lay deep foundations of humility I think that's a good picture and image there. You know, you think about, I don't know if you think about this much when you go to the beach, but I think about it because I have a construction background. I love getting like places like right on the beach where you can like, I like, personally, I like getting about five or six stories up where I can like look out over the, over the ocean, read my Bible. That's like my favorite thing to vacate and do. But while I'm sitting up there, I think about the dirt that's underneath me and how it's sandy, <laughs> and how it sifts and shifts around, right? And then I think, well, what kind of what kind of foundation does this building have? Is there a chance if a windstorm comes in, will it just sort of f- fall face down? Because this this is sort of like the sinking ground Jesus talks about, right? I mean, you can dig right in it when you go down to the beach, and it's not much better, you know, 20, 30 yards back off of the ocean. Nebuchadnezzar here. In verse 4, we see that his foundation is rooted in self. By recounting this section here, the troubling dream he received from God, he is troubled by it. He notes that life was good, but that he was at ease in his house and flourishing in his palace. Right? Though we cannot be certain, this would probably be around his reign 605 to 562, something like that. He had successfully secured and was enjoying a well-deserved time of rest and relaxation from conquering his enemies all around him. However, God hit him kind of right between the eyes with this personal crisis through a dream that frightened him. Verse 5, in fact, as he lay in his bed, he said, the images and visions in my mind alarmed me. This dream was another nightmare to which the king uh, would have attacked futuristic significance there, attached futuristic significance. So he had already done previously in 2, 2, and 3. He called the pagan wise men in to try to figure it out, and of course they can't. Now let me say one thing about the goodness of God in disturbing us. Um, have I ever shared with you my dad's testimony when he came to Christ? Have I ever shared that with you all? My dad was not a believer in Christ until I was about almost done with high school. Have, you, have I told you all this story before? Nobody knows this in here. Um, he, he had went to church on and off growing up in Kingsport, but he went to Berea, which is a liberal Christian college. And when he was there, he was told by one of the professors that the Bible was written by uh, bigoted, biased men, and it was oppressive to women, and he didn't need to believe any of it. You know, just glean the moral things you can glean out of it and go on. And uh, we even talked about that when I was a kid one time. He was telling me this. And then, and then the day came when the Lord disturbed him and disturbed his sleep. And here's how it came. Uh, he had a man working for him who was taking down scaffolding. And his, this is back. Scaffolding now is different. Back when I worked for Dad 20-some years ago, you actually had to physically build scaffold with six foot bucks up. I'm sure many of you have done that, right? It was a lot of hard work. But it's what we have here for the lights. You know, we got to get up in there. It looks kind of like that. And I, no one knows for some reason, probably by God's plan, nobody was right near him, and he fell from 12 feet off the ground. Just fell, and he landed square on his head. Now, he survived the fall, but he was unconscious. They rushed the paramedics out, and they took him to the hospital there, Holston Valley Hospital, which at the time, and it was an excellent top-notch hospital, would have been one that the president would have taken to for heart problems if he was in an area that was close by. I don't know if they still hold that or not, but it was that way back then. And um, he, he basically was placed on life support immediately. And uh, I've been trying to sort of reach my dad with the gospel for a long time, been praying that God would save him and just kept failing miserably. Like I would try to share the gospel with him. It is so hard to share the gospel with family that you love dearly. It's hard. Uh, but, you know, I just kept praying, right? And this, you know, we prayed for a long time, prayed for years. 
and uh, and this tragedy happened and it just so happened this this man's father was still alive and his mother and they went to a, a sister baptist church southern baptist church down there in kingsport and that pastor was at the invitation of the father came to the hospital and he began and, and this was like they kept this guy on life support for about two weeks and so for two weeks dad didn't hardly sleep he couldn't hardly eat you know he was really disturbed by this and i just out of God's sovereign plan, this, pap, this Baptist pastor and this group of people who are, are shocked and disturbed by these events, he shares the gospel with them in the hospital waiting room. And my dad, along with about five other people, came to Christ right there in the waiting room at Holston Valley Medical Center. And, and it was genuine. I believe it was genuine. He was different after that day, forever has been different since that day was eager to be baptized and was so excited to become a greeter at the church there that we attended First Baptist Fall Branch, took that job seriously because he loved to be around the people there. So, you know, uh, but God disturbed him deeply to get him there. He disturbed him deeply. And it, sometimes we are praying for people to be relieved of a disturbance that they have had. In reality, that disturbance may be the very thing that they need to be broken and that's what he needed in that particular case so I guess the admonishment here is one don't stop praying for those loved ones that need the Lord and two when those disturbances come trust the Lord in them that young man did not survive eventually they did unplug him and he passed but six people came to know Christ through that now they could have obviously come by other means but this was the way it happened and uh, so, anyhow, I think I'm going to land the plane there for now. We'll pick up with chapter 4 again next Wednesday. Does that sound good? Uh, we'll leave a little bit of time here for prayer. Uh, I think that's a good landing point, don't you? <laughs> Trust God's disturbances. <laughs> it, it is, he is at work. All right. One that was not on the prayer list I want to mention is that Don Ross did go to the hospital and was there Monday. I don't know if he came home today or not. I hadn't had a chance to check on him yet. I think he had some low fluids, so be in prayers for him. He's a, he's a very sweet man. If you don't know Don Ross, I, I'd recommend you get to know him. He uh, used to be a, a jump sergeant for the military years ago. Jokes around said he used to be over six feet tall. You know, he's a shorter guy. He said, but all those jumps out of an airplane made me shorter each time. <laughs> so, uh, you see the rest that is there. I um, want to draw attention to uh, John Williams. Gail called me this week and his cancer has spread to his hip bones. I think it's on both sides, that right? So just keep praying for her. Uh, and the surgery's coming up on the 27th. They're going to be removing the tumor that's on the... Which thigh is it, Gail? I can't remember. Is it the right? Which thigh is it that the tumor's on? Is it the right side? The right, that's what I thought. Yeah, Because I was thinking last time I saw him, he was sitting in his office, and I think it was the right side there, yeah. So um, so let's pray for him, and pray for, that fam pray for Gail and all of them tonight. Uh, so... Any additional that are not on here? I'm going to be typing these out and make sure they get sent in. Uh, I did go see Harold today, and uh, he is awaiting results from his um, biopsy. Won't get those till next week. He has no appointments this week, and to be quite honest, he just wiped out. He just was sort of slouched down in his chair, and he just has no energy at all. So thank you for asking. Any others? Thank you all for praying for my sister-in-law. Uh, she is not doing any treatments the month of July. She's taking a break. She's done with her first round of chemo and radiation. And so we'll, I think they're going to restart everything back in August, pretty early in August. So, but they're giving her a month to kind of recoup from the first round. So, so far, so good. Okay, as good as it can go. But just keep praying and trusting the Lord with this disruption, won't we? With this disturbance. Okay. Sam Hyder, Friday, skin cancer on the jaw. Skin cancer removal from the jaw. Will that be here or will you go to North Carolina? Kingsport. Kingsport? Okay. Man, Kingsport feels so far away. Boone's Creek? Okay, yeah. Every time I, I have to go to Kingsport, I'm like, really? There's no way around it. 
<laughs> Back when I lived there, that's how I felt about this side. But now that I live here, you know, anyhow. All right. Any others? I have a praise for you guys. You want to praise tonight too? Praise sounds good. I was meeting with a family from VBS where the daughter was saved uh, last night. And uh, we're walking over to kind of walk through the baptistry and all that. I went back over the gospel with her to make sure she understood it. And the parents understood it. We all did it together. We're walking over and the husband says, uh, well, pastor, I just feel like I need to tell you that my wife's never been baptized. I was like, well, she hasn't. <laughs> they said no. And so we were up here and I'm showing, you know, uh, little Riley what's going to happen and how it's going to work. Makes the kids feel more comfortable, makes everybody feel more comfortable. And then I looked and said, Mom, do you want to be baptized too? I said, you, you, you understand the gospel we went over tonight? She said, yes. And, and I, I said, well, you want to be obedient now to the Lord? That's the first step. And be baptized? She said, yeah, I do. <laughs> so, so we're going to have another baptism. So, but I told her, I said, now I got to tell you this. This has happened before. We've had, there was a Sunday we had like seven or eight baptisms a while back. Do y'all remember that? It's been a while ago, but... I said, I didn't know this at the time. That is the smallest baptistry I've ever been in in all my ministry. And every time somebody would walk out, they would take water with them. So every time they'd walk out, the water level would drop. So I told her, I said, when we do this, I'm going to line y'all up from tallest to shortest. And the tallest has to go first, and the shortest goes at the end. And that's just the way it's going to have to be, because there's going to be a slew of you on that Sunday. All right either that or we're going to have to go to the swimming pool one of the two either way we're going to get them under so so anyhow now when, when that that time i bat do y'all remember when i baptized um gosh what was his name scott heaton do you remember that you know scott's as big as i am or bigger and uh son when he went back he, he about baptized me with him you know <laughs> I, we both got rededicated that day so anyhow but that family, the Lord seems to be working, and they're, they're excited to be part of our church and moving forward with that. So God's been working there, and it's just a great thing. But yeah, we're going to have, I, I think we're having at least six baptisms that day. It may be eight. I have to look at the numbers again, but it's at least six. So on July, you don't want to miss church on July 31st, okay? That's the day. I wish it was on the day of the picnic because it's all combined. It'd been easier on a lot of levels, but anyway, that's okay. It works out. All things do in the Lord's will. So, so give praise for that. And I, most of these are new salvations. Like these are children who have come to the Lord. Now, before you get all patting the pastor on the back, let me say a couple things about that. Some of these kids are our kids. They come to Sunday school. They get taught the Bible at home. And they've been hearing truth for several years from our Sunday school teachers, from their parents, from the pulpit. And the Lord's just now moving in their little hearts and lives to, to respond. So... You know, it's kind of a, this is a community effort to see children come to the Lord like that. But ultimately, the Lord gets all the credit, you know. So we just need to keep being faithful to what God's given us to do. See, that's, that's my point with that. So. All right, well, let's close in a word of prayer. Who'd like to close us tonight? Somebody close us? What a great lesson tonight for us. <laughs> I'm going to go home and think that Nebuchadnezzar was so prideful. I'm glad I'm not like him. <laughs> and completely missed the whole lesson tonight <laughs> dear lord thank you for not making me like that nebuchadnezzar and that tax collector <laughs> you know All right, anybody want to close some prayer tonight thank you sam appreciate it